And Rabbi Ned is going to come up now and share a little bit, um, and we will then continue with the tour service. Yep. Just a few various and sundry thoughts. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to say our, our, our uh, parish of today, Shalia, and uh, Lech Lecha, of course, we're familiar with that word because we had our Shalia, right? Mm-hmm. We had our sent one come and visit us, Dan Justin, right? He was an apostle, he was, he was a sent one. He sent out to the congregations to shore us up, to love us, uh, to be um, a father to us. So we know that. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that uh, when you read that last uh, New Testament portion, uh, when Yeshua says no one's good, uh, well, actually, uh, Rabbi Tanushin, uh wrote the great book, the New York Times number one bestseller in the 70s and 80s, like years running, uh, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Uh, he should have known his Torah. Uh, perhaps he should have known what uh, the Jewish Messiah said about that. Uh, the whole premise is wrong. There are no good people. We're all bad. And yet, amazingly, good things happen to us all the time. <laughs> and think about it. It's not the one plane that goes down. It's the hundred thousand that makes it to their destination. It's the grace and mercy of God uh, upon us that, that, that keeps us, that, um, that helps us in his, his love to us. Uh, the other thing that I always like to read... Uh, um, um, Numbers chapter 13, uh, that parasha, to, verse, to chapter 15, uh, to the background of Karen Carpenter, who sang, You've Only Just Begun, uh, White Lace and Promises, A Kiss for Luck and You're On Your Way. <laughs> and uh, it didn't turn out that well. You know, <laughs> you think of relationships, how rocky they can be, and we're starry-eyed when we get, when we first start out, and then reality hits. And uh, as I like to say, um, Marriage is not primarily to make you happy, it's to get that selfishness out of you. <laughs> so just a couple of thoughts on the parasha, just from the least important, I think, to what the most... Uh, in the very end of the parasha, chapter 15 of um, Numbers, uh, we have this thing, with this idea where, uh, where Israel goes into the land, and Orthodox, uh, observant Jewish people do this today. Uh, what God expected of Israel was to, uh, when they go into the land and they had their first harvest, and, they, and their first uh, produce of bread, they were to take a portion of that and they were to offer that to the Lord. And doing that, he colonized, uh, like, like, in other words, it holified the rest of the, the bread. And so uh, Orthodox uh, observant Jewish people do that today. If, a, if it's a traditional Jewish home, the woman of the house uh, will uh, bake a bread and, and she'll take a tiny bit of that and wrap it in a piece of tin foil and burn that at another place in the oven. And this is a way of sanctifying or make or holify that meal and, and sanctify it, setting it apart. Well, Rabbi Paul uh, was no slouch, either, I like to say. He was a uh, spirit-filled genius. He was a rabbinic scholar that learned uh, under the greatest rabbi of his day, Gamaliel. And uh, he uses this analogy. He goes back to Numbers 15 in our parasha, and he says, if the first piece of challah, because that's the word back in Numbers 15, challah, uh, if the pers- first piece of challah is holy, the lump is also. And what Paul is, not Paul is not introducing a new doctrine, this is not new, but what he's saying is that the, re- the, the remnant sanctifies the rest. The fact that Israel has a saved small, righteous sermon. This is God's way of guaranteeing that the rest will ultimately come to faith. Paul is a, a genius. He looks back, he sees this principle, he uses it, and think about that today. We, it's not a new doctrine. We know that Abraham said to God, if there were just ten people, would you would you not destroy him? He wouldn't. Of course there were ten, unfortunately. And we jump over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Rabbi Paul talks about the, the spouse, that is the believing spouse, sanctifies, sets apart the unbelieving spouse. It's not necessarily a guarantee that they're going to be saved, but it places that unbelieving spouse under the special intentionality of God to come to the Lord. And so and so, Paul is using this powerfully to say that if there is a remnant, it is a guarantee that the rest will ultimately come to faith. But for the other thing I just want to say is, uh, uh, I think it was Mitch or Sam that said something about you know, People who are new here, we're, we don't use, we're not using the word Jesus a lot. Of course, I have deep affection for the 
the, the, the term Jesus because I got saved in the 70s and the Messianic movement was just a flattering thing. But Yeshua is his name, right? So we wanted to make that clear. We use the name Yeshua. Well, uh, I always like to say, you know, people ask sometimes, where in the Hebrew Bible does it tell us that the name of the Messiah would be called Jesus? And there's a lot of places, and this parashah is one of them in Numbers 13. Because what Moses does is very ingenious. It's very prophetic what he does. Think about it. He, he takes a man who will come after him, and he changes his name from Hoshea, which means salvation, to Joshua. Now, there's no J in Hebrew. If you live in Israel and your name is George, like George Whitten, people are going to call you George. That's just the reality, right? So he, so Moses takes the name Hoshea and he tacks part of the Tetragrammaton onto it. And he attaches the Yah, which is Yahweh, Yehovah, Yehoshia. He attaches that onto the front like a prefix and he changes the name from Hoshea to Yahoshia. Yeshua is simply a condensed or shortened version of the name Yehoshia, Yehoshua. All I'm trying to say to you is Yeshua is Jehovah, he is God. Jehovah is salvation. All I want to say to you is that you have to lift, you have to raise up your opinion of Yeshua. It's too small, right? Your understanding of Yeshua is too small. He's big. He's big, he's big, he's big. Okay? So that's number two. The last thing I just want to say real quickly to us is the spies. This is a horrible thing. What they were saying to you and I is this. God wants this for you, but you can't get it. Have you, have you ever thought that? You, God, I know God has this for you, but I just can't get it. And that's what they were saying. They came back, and the false report was, the Sean Harrah, the false report was, yeah, it's all good, but you guys can't get it. And think about that. This is something that, that is it's, 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 it's as fresh as 1922. I mean, we say all that, we are always faced with the natural truth and the promise, right? We talked about that in our class, right? And Abraham is considered the model of walking out New Testament faith and righteousness in the New Testament, right? Paul uses him in Romans right, as the model. If you want to please God, this is the kind of faith you have to have. It's the kind of faith that calls things that, calls things that are not as though they are. It's the kind of faith that calls things that do not exist as if they do exist. Abraham is just like us. It's just like these spies. The two could see in the spirit. The rest did. They all saw the same thing. So you and I are always faced with this, the same issue that these spies were. The, the, here's the issue. You, are, you have the promise of God and you have the natural truth. You have the promise of God on one hand and you have the physical reality on the other hand. And Abraham, it says, didn't waver. He didn't. He wasn't indecisive over about two decisions. That he, he was strong in faith. He believed God. These two spies believed God. They 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 entered. I believe Abraham entered into faith confession. He saw the reality. He saw and he saw his wife's age. And it was impossible. And yet he looked at the promise. And you you and I are always faced with that. People say God has a thing, but you can't get it. You have to you have to believe the promise. You have to deny your senses. You have to say this, this is a promise. This is a physical reality. But I believe the promise, and we'll be like the two stars. <laughs> Amen. Amen.